Z87 is upon us, and we have JJ in the house to tell us what is going on with Z87, Haswell. Uh, there's going to be a lot of videos, guys. So um, first, we want to talk about the entire platform and just you know talk about what's new. So how you doing, JJ? I'm doing all right. Thank you for asking. Ready to jump in and, uh, and talk about Z87? Dude, let's break it down. We just uh, essentially gone through a brand new platform launch, right? So we've got an entirely new chipset that's coming to the market, mm -hmm. Z87. Uh, it essentially is replacing the previous generation Z77-based chipset. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a performance mainstream chipset. So we're not talking about something that's going to be replacing X79, which currently exists in the marketplace. So I think that's right there. That's a big question maybe for a lot of you guys that are on the kind of enthusiast segmentation side trying to figure out, you know, should I be buying into this or should I be still considering even Sandy Bridge or X79? And the truth of the matter is that it's not going to change if you're looking for more cores, more cache, more PCI Express lanes, you know, more density in terms of the memory, you want more bandwidth. X79 is still going to be that highest end based platform. There's no changes there. Yeah, it's the most expensive as well. Uh, it is, but I mean, if you're still talking about relative buy in to the cost, I mean, you can get a 3820 for about $300. So comparatively, yeah. there is still a pretty close similarity between the K part and the entry level port on Sandy Bridge E. The board cost tends to be, of course, a little bit higher, so that's where you're gonna probably see the differential, right? Uh, you know, our ZA7 boards are gonna probably drop down to as little as about 140 bucks, and they're gonna go up from there. Uh, whereas, you know, the baseline uh, X79 boards are gonna be a bit more expensive. Yeah, I'm running a 3820, I love mm -hmm. it, but there are some features on the Z87. Yes. That I want. Yeah, there's there, and that's that's probably where the biggest differential is going to come into play. I mean, if we talk about the chipset in itself compared to the previous E77, things are going to be pretty similar, right? We're not talking about a massive amount of differential, but there's some key points that are different. One, of course, is going to be that the PCH has gotten some updates. So things like you know the SATA 6G ports, we've got six of those integrated now. Finally, the chipset. finally, yeah. I've been waiting for that for a long time from Intel. I'm so glad that we finally have. Uh, six gigabit per second SATA all the way across. Yeah, so that's a nice... We got six of those from the chipset. That's correct. That's a nice plus. We've got more inherent uh, SATA bandwidth available to us. USB 3 has also got a little bit of a bump up in terms of a total from now. Previous generation being four, we have six. Mm -hmm. um, the six is what's referred to as their variable IO port flexibility technology. So there's some yeah. dependencies as far as how the vendor wants to implement that on the motherboard. But for all intents and purposes, we're pretty much looking at six and six. Um, outside of that, the other really big change is the CPU in itself. Uh, for most of you guys, it's probably not going to really be a huge impactor to how you work with the motherboard, quote unquote, but we have the fiber or what's referred to as the IVR. Right. Um, and that's a probably a pretty big change because uh, you're taking essentially all the power regulation technology um, that used to preside on the motherboard and now we've put it inside inside the CPU. Um, and pretty much just what that means is, is that there's going to be some changes at how you kind of tweak, tune, and maybe adjust the platform. Um, but if you guys have worked with our boards in the past, because of our previous digital controls, things are going to be pretty similar. But Yeah, and I know there's some confusion. Some people see that and they think the entire VRM is now on the chip. And that's ridiculous. Yeah. But some people do think that and... I mean, I can understand they, they if, if you're not someone who really nerds out about this stuff, I can understand how they say, oh, the voltage controls are now here, so that must mean that all that is there and it's yeah. going to get really hot, but that's not the case. That is a great point. Uh, you're 100% right. So if you know we're taking a look at the topology of the board, yeah. here we would have the VRM heat sink, yeah. and underneath that we have things like the inductors, or some people call them the chokes, or as they're loosely referred to as phases, but phases in a, is an electrical term, not the physical item itself. Yeah. And then underneath that we have things like our MOSFETs and our drivers and, of course, all the capacitors. So none of that's going away it's essentially there was a very small little chip that we had over here in the corner that was essentially the PWM that helps to control um, the actual voltage that's coming out from the power supply and then converting it uh, for the CPU so we still kind of have that coming in play we still have to have an external controller and then something inside for the CPU but for all intents and purposes it doesn't yeah. really change how you work with the motherboard but there are some changes to the platform yeah, as it, a whole. it does get warmer and th that's going to create some limitations as far as overclocking go but it's still can be more stable. Uh, we can get into that in our overclocking video. Yeah. And if you guys want to see the overclocking video, uh, we did a full tutorial and you can click on the link here and check that video out. Uh, but right now what I want to talk about mainly is just what's different about this compared to Z77. Mm -hmm. And then I want to kind of talk about like, you know, who should upgrade and, and what, if, you know, what features you should look for if you are up upgrading. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so the K-series part is going to have some increased levels of adjustment uh, because of the way that the fiber and, and changes that Intel have put in there. So we have things like the strap. If you remember from X79, yeah. uh, you've got that strap adjustment available to you. You're going to have more maximum voltage levels that are going to be available. Plus there's some special what are called gear ratios that are available for the CPU. So I guess if you're really bent and you want to push iGPU performance, you're going to be able to tune the GPU probably to a higher clock speed. 
Now, speaking of the strap, um, I've only played with the K parts. Mm -hmm. I haven't myself been able to touch any of the other parts. Can you mess with the base clock on the other parts to achieve an overclock? Or is, you can. Because I, I know the multiplier is pretty much locked. Yeah, I mean, you can, but it's going to still be pretty much locked to the same degree. So in, in previous generations, you usually had a margin of somewhere between about three to five, excuse me, three to five bumps on the BCLK. And it's not going to really be exceeding that. For all intents and purposes, you're still pretty much, when you're looking at a non-K part, yeah. you're still going to be clock limited in terms of what you can do with it as far as pushing it past of the reference clock speeds. Right. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, I want to talk about who should upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think, you know, if we take a look at it from a power efficiency standpoint, you know, if you're considering uh, performance to watt, which is always kind of a key characteristic that yeah. not a lot of people probably look at uh, if you're an enthusiast. I mean, you know me, I've been building for a really long time and it's not always that thing that kind of jumps into your brain. But at the end of the day, you know, if you talk about, you know, affecting the heat output inside of your room, as well as, you know, how much power you're going to be consuming, it's a really great and efficient platform, especially if you're running it at stock. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a good marker point. Performance is going to be better in terms of you're locking you're looking somewhere between about five to fifteen percent on average faster ipc performance than the previous generation and if you're talking from previous generations so you're somebody let's say it was on like linfield clarkdale Blue, even the yeah, field yeah um anything like that you're going to get actually a pretty significant upgrade mm -hmm. if you're right now on z77 um i definitely think that there's an outstanding level of feature set that are on our moon motherboards that yeah. might justify you maybe yeah, that's, wanting that's to jump when you over. just upgrade for the features if you it, want those features exactly and that's going to be really dependent on the type of user that you're at right Right. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the performance of the architecture in itself, if you've already got a 3770K um, and, you know, you're overclocking it, you know, and you're getting great performance out of it, you know, there, there's going to be, of course, less need for you necessarily to jump uh, and consider this as a, as a platform update. But, you know, it's still going to be an overall faster platform and you're still going to have a great set of new features to be able to, uh, to incorporate into your build. So that's really kind of decision that you kind of have to make as far as, you know, what makes sense for you and what you're doing. I will note anybody that's probably doing any type of content creation, though, could be getting actually significantly higher upgrades with, especially yes. the new updates that they've made to the AVX engines inside of uh, Haswell could be a huge increase in performance. Yeah, and as, as the new program starts to take advantage of that and implement some changes in their code, it'll even be better. Yeah, that's correct. So, you know, that's probably a little bit off. You know, we're probably looking somewhere between, you know, three to six months before we start to see some of the consumer-based applications finally phase in support for second-generation AVX. Um, but it'll come more frequently, frequently, and with that, you know, you're going to get quite a bit more performance. Right. So I think that gives, you know, some perspective probably as far as, you know, the lay of the land in relation to Z77, uh, Z87, you know, what performance and what features that might look like. Yep. So we hope this helped you guys out. Um, I mean, there's a lot to consider when considering the new motherboards. Uh, we've got a lot of different videos to help you. So what you want to do is just take a look at this list of videos on the screen right now. Click on the ones uh, that you're you know curious about. There's a lot of features on these Asus motherboards, a ton. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot that differentiates you guys uh, from the competition. So we're going to talk about all those different things in these other videos. So check out those. Thanks, to, thanks for being here, JJ. Uh, thanks. You know, and I'll say just one last point. You know, we'll cover this in the overclocking video. But mm -hmm. for everybody, I think they always have like a doorknob question. Well, what's overclocking look like? You know, overall, technically, maximum clocks are going to be pretty similar to Ivory Bridge. But the big differential is going to be in terms of the variance. So we'll cover that, of course, in the overclocking video. Yeah. And even with, uh, you know, a lower number on the overclock, you're still getting some really good speed. Yeah. So we'll see you guys next time.